Welcome to the National Land Values Webinar. I'm Eric O'Keefe, editor of The Land Report, and it's my privilege to host the third annual installment of this national overview of farmland as an asset class. Joining me today are Dr. Bruce Sherrick, director of the TIAA Center for Farmland Research at the University of Illinois, Dave Muth, the managing director of People's Company Capital Markets, Dave Melnicki, director of appraisal at People's Company, and Steve Brewer, president of People's Company, a nationally recognized leader in agriculture real estate. Steve, give our listeners a bit of background on People's Company, where it came from and how it got to today. Uh, thanks, Eric. And uh, we're excited to, to roll out this third annual land values presentation. Uh, People's Company this year will celebrate our 50th anniversary, and we have an opportunity to work on farmland transactions all across the country. Uh, on the on the brokerage side, we'll, we'll handle about a billion dollars worth of transactional work this year. Uh, we've got about 25 appraisers in our office that do valuation work all across the country. Uh, a lot of work for banks, trust departments, and then we do a lot of NACREF appraisal work. You'll hear a lot about NACREF in our data today. Uh, we manage farms in about 20 different states now. And then you'll hear from Dave Muth on the capital markets side where we're working with family offices, institutions that want to deploy capital into farmland. Uh, we work with a lot of those groups to do their acquisition work and diligence work and ongoing farm management work. And then we're also uh, in the energy management business, managing oil and gas rights, mineral interest, uh, solar and, and wind projects. And so we'll get a little bit into that today as well. And then we're going to talk a little bit about crop insurance in today's call. And so I've got the privilege to work with a, a great organization of folks that work in the land business on a daily basis and work in all the major egg markets across the country. And that, that gives us a lot of great insight as we think about land values, not only, you know, in the Midwest where our home office is, but in the Pacific Northwest and California and the Mississippi Delta, uh, up in the Lake States and down in the Southeast United States. Uh, we just get an opportunity to see a lot of transactions on an annual basis. And so it's our privilege to share some of that information with you folks today. Bruce? Given your background in, in land economics, this makes you ideally suited to reviewing and interpreting the reams of data that are produced annually by local, regional, statewide, and national entities. What are we going to be reviewing today data-wise? Well, thanks, Eric. There are really about three major sources of data. And as you know, farmland markets are kind of a slow moving thing. So getting real time and up-to-date data is complicated. But we have an annual survey by the USDA that's been done for um, about 70 years, actually, and it's in different forms. But we have a, a system where we can account for land at the state level from USDA and then manage the income, appreciation, and others in kind of an aggregated way to come up with rates of return. Secondly, we have in the U.S. something called NACRE for the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. And that's a very unique data set because 30 Two years ago, uh, institutional investors uh, who were in the market at the time got together and agreed on a common standard for reporting. And then it goes into kind of a, an anonymized uh, storage system. And then we can pull it back out of that anonymized storage system and report on a common basis all the institutionally owned and managed land in the U.S., or most of it anyhow. There's some non-participating members, but it's become really, truly the industry standard. And then the third source is individual states often have a mechanism by which we can go in and look at actual land sales if it's a reporting state, you know, or there may be an active uh, society of farm managers and rural appraisers that lets us get into the data systems. But all of that is then housed in something called the TIA Center for Farmland Research. Uh, at the University of Illinois, we've had a long history of, uh, kind of thought leadership, I guess, in the area of farm management and in in ag finance, and we've maintained some connection to the farmland market space all the way back to about 1917, when the very first farm credit system institution was actually launched in our department. Uh, some time ago, uh, uh, Tia, then Tia Kraft, now it's Tia Nuveen, uh, decided that given their large position in the farmland market space, that they would like to have a permanent place somewhere in the country that was uh, dedicated to doing independent research. So I want to make that point that despite the name, it's a fully independent research entity at the University of Illinois. 
So we've, we've kept track of that and we've kept track of all the other door, uh, data systems that we can uh, locate to try to get a really good strong handle on how farm and markets move. Given those data sets, how are these metrics different from more traditional valuations that are done on a nationwide basis? So one of the things we've done, Eric, through time is to put together both a valuation and a rate of return series so that we can come up with something that is much more reflective of the actual financial performance of the farmland investments than you would get just from a survey on land values or separately just a survey on farm income or something like that. So what we have done and what we've been able to do and and reconstruct uh, back through time actually quite well is combine uh, returns at the asset level Uh, property taxes subtracted, appreciation correctly displayed through time so that we can aggregate it and come up with a series that we can then meaningfully compare to other financial series uh, like stocks and bonds and uh, mortgage rates and uh, gold and uh, commodity markets. I think we're up to around 75 different asset classes that we keep track of in addition to state level actual rates of return to farmland investment. Uh, all across the country. So it's a it's one kind of unified set, if you will, that in addition to just land value price changes, which you can get from lots of sources, honestly, uh, we can construct an actual rate of return or a, a baseline performance measure. So it's obviously a lot more sophisticated in, in, instead of just being direct price orientated. oriented. Right, right. It's, it's um, um, not the simplest of construction every year. Uh, but I think once you get it built and continue to build it in the same way year after year after year after year, it becomes a very useful metric against which you can measure performance. And then do, do meaningful things like say, how does farmland impact a mixed asset portfolio? If you had stocks and bonds and added farmland, what would happen? Or if you were mm-hmm. looking at the uh, spread over inflation, which we'll talk about in a bit, or if you were looking at how commodity market differences, say Pacific Northwest versus Southeast, where you may have apples versus citrus, or you Mm -hmm. wanted to look at row crops that are, you know, in a traditional uh, cash rent as opposed to uh, directly operated, or you wanted to look at pistachios and almonds. So we've, we've developed a fairly comprehensive system so that we can disaggregate and compare things that might be impacting parts of the country differently. With that in mind, Bruce, give us a market update for 2022, please. Perfect. So 2022 is actually one of the most interesting, truly fascinating years, at least in my memory. Farmland markets have just kind of gone through a two-year bull run that we really don't have any real precedent for in, in recent history. You can go back into the 70s and get kind of a similar percentage change. But what I want to do in the next few slides is just kind of level set and say, what are the levels of prices? How have they changed? How have they changed in a two-year period? And what's the total rate of return that an investor in farmland would have experienced during that period? The first slide is a very basic one, just a map of the US that shows average crop land values at the state level. Now, remember the definition of a farm is very broad. So it includes hobby farms and small farms, and it involves farms that are kind of um, what I would call a lifestyle farm, in addition to mega farms or farms that are uh, involved in production for practices that are not only cropland. So we separate this down and come down just to cropland, but it's generally understood that, that USDA numbers are very conservative relative to what you would think of as commercially viable farms. So high quality farmland in Illinois and in Indiana and Iowa might sell for anywhere from 10 to $22,000 an acre, depending on where you are and what the market conditions are. I think one of the recent records actually was 27000 an acre. So when you average across all quality types, though, in that state, you get to the numbers that you're seeing here. What's interesting is to say how much have those increased. And the first slide here on the cropland price change just shows the percentage appreciation from 21 to 22. And again, to be Frank, these numbers are a little bit conservative because they include more than what we would think of as commercially viable farmland. So again, Iowa being around 20%, Illinois being around 13%, those are very, very conservative numbers compared to what actually happened in what you would think of as uh, transactional markets at scale. And again, looking around the country, uh, Pacific Northwest, down to California, down through the Delta and Texas, Uh, you'll see that there's a bit of a pattern that favored in the last year areas that are more likely to have produced row crops. 
there are other points in history where permanent crops or vegetable crops or um, livestock might have been the favorite industry, but we'll talk about the things that led to the last couple of years really being very, very positive for uh, row crop production. So again, 2021 through 2022, if we were to look at a two-year price change, and this is just the price change, remember, does not include the income component, and the income component has been very strong as well. But just looking at the price change, uh, two-year period, some parts of the country up over 40%. So as we talked a little bit ago, just being able to look at not just price change, but what was the actual investor performance, uh, it'd be like saying, what was the stock price change without accounting for dividends? We have the annual income to add to this as well. And if you were to look at the crop um, returns, just a single year where you had income, but you paid taxes, income minus property taxes as a geometrically compounded or a rate of return against the amount invested in the land at the beginning of the year, you come up with the numbers shown on this slide. And again, this is just a, a really strong performance. Uh, and one of the things that this will lead into as we talk further on in the uh, webinar is how does this compare through time? How does this compare with other assets? And what is most remarkable is not just the incredible strength, but the stability in these numbers and how they've performed through time and how they've related to other assets. If we were to look around the country and put some regional definitions in place, uh, these are both USDA and NACREF regional definitions that are designed to homogenize, if you will, the kind of production that occurs in that region. So the Corn Belt is a collection of states that primarily produce corn. The Delta is the region uh, and around the mouth of the Mississippi that has similar crop production and so on, Pacific Northwest and so on. Uh, and then at the bottom of this chart, the three categories that are um, commonly reported, NACREF total farmland on a one year, five year, 10, 15 and 20 for each of these regions and each of these aggregations. The, the highlighted or bolded ones are the areas that we'll be able to, in this webinar, address with a bit more depth and have a conversation with everyone about what are the forces and factors that are leading to this performance. Given these numbers of the total cropland return, what are the factors that are affecting those returns right now in the market today? Well, there are quite a few and they won't be surprises to anybody. The first slide I want to look at that helps to address this is just the a result of the Federal Reserve's open market uh, committee actions on interest rates. You'll, you'll notice that the, the stark upward and downward movements in the discount rate happened around periods of time like the housing crisis in 08 and the beginning of the pandemic in 20. And the, um, uh, the I guess, information to take from this chart is that we've had kind of a herky-jerky start and stop impact on interest rates, but we had a period where interest rates were very, very low consistently low for a long period of time, which meant that you could pay a lot for future income, very much like the stock market, a PE idea would be that if interest rates are low, the cost of borrowing were below, you would pay a lot for future income or a high multiple. And as interest rates go up, you can't pay as much for that future income because it's, it's a bit like a higher discount rate. Uh, so in farmland though, we have to remember that it's a fairly lowly leveraged asset class and there are other things going on as well. The, the reason the Fed did this was because at the at far right part of the chart, the reason they did that was to try to get a handle on inflation. And inflation has just been running rampant, of course. Uh, uh, the print from last week on inflation uh, being you know, considered positive news that it was in the high sevens, but lower than people actually had expected. Um, you know, kind of explains a lot of what's going on in the economy. But we want to talk about the fact that inflation has sort of substituted in people's minds for the most important factor affecting farmland instead of just discount rates. And so, again, jumping way off into a summary, I realize this is uh, a lot to absorb at once. But this slide just shows the total farmland return and inflation spread. So the degree by which farmland returns were higher than inflation. So the, the darker line below the farmland return line is actually the amount over which it beat inflation. The, the gap between the red and the gray line 
therefore is essentially the inflation rate in that period of time. And as you look far to the right, one of the things that's important to notice is, one, how uniformly correlated these two series are. Farmland turns out to be a fantastic inflation hedge. But as we get to the very far right-hand side, uh, every other year is displayed. The very last uh, point on this um, chart is in 2022. The farmland return, in fact, was increasing faster than inflation was increasing. So the spread got even wider. I think people miss that to some degree. It's actually been a, kind of a super performing asset. Inflation went up and went to really, really high levels by historic standards, but rates of return increased by even more. The other thing that is important, and I think Dave will talk about this with uh, more context and um, a bit more depth, but just farmland uh, values and the response to commodity prices is a complicated relationship because high prices generally happen when you have low yields. So clear back in 2012, the projected price is the average of the futures price for December contract for corn during the month of February. Uh, 2011, 12, and 13 were relatively high prices. We had very low production. So you usually get the case where you have high prices because you had low production. Total revenues don't change that much. Income drives land prices, not the price of commodities. But what happened in 2022 is quite a unique story. We had reasonably good yields and high prices. Now, this has come about for a collection of factors. Again, Dave will talk a bit more about this, but you know, disruptions in the world's um, supplies from the Ukraine, the war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, some other kind of uh, perfect storm events that led to higher prices. But I think this is really important because it signals the high income that had built. Uh, farmers had received a lot of income from market facilitation payments and CFAP and uh, you know, both trade disruptions and pandemic payments. So farmers had a very strong balance sheet at the same time they got pretty high commodity prices and high commodity prices with high yields is super high income. So I think those are the basic factors, especially in the Corn Belt, that led to, as we saw the pattern earlier, the highest prices being concentrated in the middle of the country. Uh, with that, maybe I would, in fact, turn to Dave to talk a little bit more about the value drivers and, and how he's seeing the world. Yeah, thank, thanks, Bruce. Uh, no, Bruce, you've painted a pretty clear picture of some pretty dynamic environmental conditions in terms of farmland values. And what we want to do is sort of roll it back and grab a little bit of perspective on what's happened here. So if we step back to 2018, right? So we had some conflict in our trade with China and uh, the administration at the time certainly wanted to sort of buffer some of those impacts uh, for farmers and ag production. Uh, we started with uh, the market facilitation program, MFP. We had two versions of MFP ad hoc payments out to farmer operator owners. And then subsequently, we followed that with uh, CFAP, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. And we're in the, the third payment uh, program within CFAP. The first two were more substantial. But giving context on this, we're talking about almost $54 billion in ad hoc cash payments that were rolled out to farmer operator owners. This is really impactful. The map that you see here uh, shows those distributions by state. Not coincidentally, uh, you see some correlation between some of Bruce's high uh, inflation, appreciation kinds of characteristics by state and where these cash payments went. Giving some context here, right? So Iowa at uh, 5.25 billion of that 54 billion, that's actually more value then in an average year, how much land transacts. So this is really impactful, right? We're talking about a lot of cash pushed in the system through these ad hoc payments. Now, and Bruce touched on this a little bit too, we had kind of a unique commodity price run in the same sort of time window. It was unique in that context of both being in high yielding or at least in trend yielding kinds of years. And also with timing, right? So in a lot of the states, particularly in the Midwest, uh, you're going to see leases and land costs set 
by the time you get through, say, September, right? And this commodity price run actually trailed that. And it created an environment by which we could see really positive, really high net incomes for farmers going into the next year. Also, putting context behind this, right, debt capital was really, really affordable. It increased buying power, particularly for those owner operators uh, within this same time period. Now, thinking about outside capital coming in, we had real asset, asset cap rate compression across the spectrum. And that created a little bit more interest in farmland, right, which is typically a lower cap rate asset class. Uh, than a lot of other arenas that uh, investors can go into. So all of these things combined uh, in order to create a little bit of a perfect storm. Now, I want to take us back a little bit to 2020, right? So when we're looking at values here in the charts and the map, we're stepping back and we're putting some context into what happened coming into 2020. And one of the key characteristics is when you look across a wide swath of the country, we were actually below trend line in terms of a 20-year history of where farmland value growth would go. And we had a little bit of a commodity price lull over a number of years that certainly was impactful in terms of growth of appreciation in farmland. So when you're looking at the map, a positive number in the map represents how far we were below the 20-year trend line in farmland values in that state. So the upper left graph showing Illinois, we were 9% below that 20-year trend line coming into 2020. There certainly were states uh, like Idaho where we we're actually above trend line, but the key takeaway here is that we had room for farmland values to catch up with that historical uh, sort of appreciation level. We also wanted to give a little bit of context on some value drivers that we're seeing going forward. And we definitely see some interesting policy impacts. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act from 2022 that was passed in August represents where uh, certainly a segment of the leadership in the country uh, wants a lot of policy initiatives to drive. So there's, there's a few takeaways here. So if we look at the Inflation Reduction Act, we're talking about a little bit under $400 billion, okay? And we're driving that towards energy, which is pretty broadly defined, certainly some manufacturing elements, environment, the electric vehicle elements are, are, are certainly at the forefront. Uh, agriculture got some direct funding, uh, particularly in the conservation programs. And then there were some drought impacts also. But let's, let's look at specifically, if we aggregate all of that funding and we start to break it down, what are we really trying to do? We have some very focused initiatives and in funding towards understanding carbon sequestration and GHG quantification. This is impactful for farmland. Additionally, we have a lot of funding that's in the backdrop of accelerating our capacity to generate electricity from renewable methods, okay? We did get our uh, conservation program funding, and we also got significant extensions for renewable biofuels support uh, within the Inflation Reduction Act. So let's look a little bit at, at what that really means. Okay, carbon sequestration. Now, this is an illustrative example, but let's put some context in thinking that about these policy initiatives being realized and how that plays back to farmland. Now, there's been a lot of work in trying to understand how we can sequester carbon within farmland soils within the U.S. and globally. Uh, the map that you see here is just a little bit of a snapshot, uh, one analysis on what the opportunity for carbon sequestration is from no-till practice adoption. Now, if we combine some base level practices, thinking about no-till, also thinking about incorporating cover crops, two of the dominant sort of practice bases by which people think about building soil organic matter, there's some analyses that are suggesting we could sequester in the range of about 200 million metric tons on U.S. farmland soils a year. Let's think through this in the context of value per metric ton of carbon. Right now, <clears throat> soil carbon 
is actually discounted because we've got some challenges, right? Uh, the key are additionality. How much additional carbon am I putting in the soil versus what was there initially? And then permanence, right? Soil carbon is not necessarily permanent. We can implement practices that would respirate that carbon and release it. So we have those discount factors now and uh, we're seeing exchanges, we're seeing actual transactions happen, you know, at barely low price points. But let's play this forward. Let's think about creating an environment by which we have standards valuing that carbon. And let's think about it at 30, 60, $90 per metric ton. If we go to that $60 level, we're talking about a significant additional annual revenue to farmland, right? Now, farmland operating at roughly a three and a half percent cap rate, we're talking about uh, $340 billion in additional value back to the asset class. If we step that forward, we could be looking at almost a, a half a trillion dollars in additional value from uh, the sale of carbon credits within the marketplace. Another one that's pretty interesting is we start to think about the renewable energy goals that are put out there and the significant funding behind them, right? This is a really clear policy directive. It's, it's not necessarily simple to get our minds wrapped around. And what we've referenced here is a net zero America study that was done at Princeton University. There's a number of different kinds of configurations and scenarios that get us to that net zero goal by 2050, which is clearly stated uh, by the current White House. And there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road as we get there. But the map on the right is showing in a 100% renewable electric generation scenario, where do we need wind and solar power based on resource analysis, right? There's, there's a lot of moving parts to how this actually emerges, but stepping back and just saying where these energy resources in, are available, wind and solar, how would we need those installations to emerge in order to build out that net zero goal? So in this scenario, in this net zero study, we're talking about 3.07 terawatts of wind capacity. And we're highlighting wind here because of this interesting interaction when we think regionally about farmland values, where are we seeing this resource emerge? So we go through a couple of interesting sort of assumptions, right? Generally speaking right now, we're at that two and three quarter megawatt produced per turbine. So we have an understanding of over a million turbines that we need out there. Just visually inspecting the map, let's say 80% of these are falling on farmland. So we're ending up with nearly 900,000 turbines on farmland. These are typically put in place through leases, $10,000 a year annual payment. That is in the range of where we see a lot of these leases. We're talking about significant, over nine, almost 9 million in revenue. And let's step back with another cap rate assumption at about 6%. Right? So we're seeing folks that are buying this ground are expecting a 6% return on this long-term lease. Now we're talking about an additional $150 billion in value to the asset class. Now, this is really important and impactful when we start to look regionally at where we have this intersection of carbon value, renewable energy value starting to come into the picture. Great wrap up there. I appreciate that, Dave. Very thorough, and it gives you an idea of what some of the possibilities are out there in terms of generating additional value with farmland. Bruce, let's go back and take a closer look on a region by region basis using those metrics that you detailed earlier in the presentation. Thanks, Eric. What we'll do now is kind of walk around the country and the insert map on the bottom right of each of these screens will describe the states from which we're getting the data. And then each of the pages has kind of a similar layout. We have farmland values, cash rent, a total return, and then the returns through time average through different windows of time. So from 1990 to present, from 2000 to present, and from 2010 to present. Uh, that is just kind of a, a standard layout that we'll do. We won't talk in detail about every single one, but we will at least start with the Corn Belt and talk about the fact that it's been an incredibly strong performer, even if you go clear back to 1990. So for 30 some years, over 10% total return and the breakdown between capital gains and income is about 6% capital gain 
a little over 4% income. I'll let you kind of digest the uh, graphs as you uh, want, but there's always a strong relationship between cash rent and farmland values because cash rent to some degree is the return uh, that you would give on an annual basis back to the owner. And what's important is not just the bump and you know, don't, don't try to make too much out of that like it's a technical analysis, but the fact that the very end of the uh, chart in 2022 shows uh, accelerating increase in both values and in cash rents. Uh, the bottom corner left chart shows kind of the variability. It gives a sense of the variability simply by looking at how much up and down happens. And you'll notice that the majority driver in the row crop areas for total return variance has to do with the capital gain or the valuation changes year to year. Moving on to the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon, a similar story, high rates of return. One of the recurring themes you'll see as we go through each of these is that from 1990 to 2022, 2000 to 2022, and 2010 to 2022, you tend to see a little bit of a falling off in the total return. But remember that that's kind of economy-wide. It's a, a secular effect where we had much higher rates in the early period of the sample than we had in the last couple. So the relative performance, if you were to compare it, say, to stocks or bonds or other real estate, actually improves through time, even though the numbers decline by percent or percent and a half in some cases. One of the things to note about the Pacific Northwest, and when we get to the Q&A, we'll have some more to say about this, but the, the Midwest tends to be the very first reacting part of the country to land market influences. And then I use the analogy that everything else is kind of on a slinky. You, you pull the first end of it, it takes a while to catch up. Pacific Northwest and the Delta in particular feel to me to display that characteristic that they don't move quite as rapidly necessarily right at first, not as much a variability in certain parts of those. And we'll talk about reasons why the Pacific Northwest is an especially interesting farmland market going forward, but just wanted to put that one in next as well. And the next biggest one is California. California just has had some remarkable patterns, not quite as high of a rate of return. And this is a little bit puzzling to me at some level because more of the returns come from permanent crops. And theoretically, you should actually have a higher return from the permanent crops through time, given the fixed nature of the above ground resources used in growing things. Trees depreciate, operating companies are riskier. You should expect a higher return through time. But in, in this particular case, it's just a little bit lower than the others. I won't spend much time on the Delta. Delta is an emerging area though. Some great features of the Delta for institutional buyers tend to have access to higher uh, parcel sizes, really good water resources, questions about moving production that are displaced other places because of pressure in water systems. Uh, the Delta seems like a natural uh, place for those to land. Of course, the uh, Mississippi River has been a, a source of a lot of conversations this year with the drought in the Midwest and the low water levels. The closer you are to the exit, the less you would be influenced by things like the difficulty in barge traffic. So all the way down by the Gulf, you have still a big impact of the uh, low water levels and tough barge traffic, but you would expect it to not be as severe as if you had to traverse you know, several hundred more miles over low water. Again, when we get to the Q&A, we can dive a little more deeply into the differential features affecting the regions, but wanted to uh, give the Delta and the big states, and then we'll finish off with one more. Uh, lake states are really interesting. Uh, in the uh, NACREF data this year for a single year return, by contrast, lake state was about 18%. For the 30 years, 32 years plus, we have about 9% total, which again has been a very remarkable, very, very remarkable performance. And the capital gain or the rate of appreciation has been higher than income by even more in this region. Uh, finally, the Southeast markets, Florida, has of course suffered through the loss of much of the fresh market orange and citrus industry with uh, greening HLB, uh, kind of in a positions and the states pictured there to some degree represent somewhat distinct markets, but they're, they're kind of competing with uh, residential and kind of competing with different uses. And there's some limited ability to even account for farm activities in certain regions. So it's a little bit more complicated area to both invest in and to track. That was a really rapid flyover of the regions. And I wanna kind of return to something we looked at earlier, 
but with a little bit more thought about what might explain the differences. So this is returning and then say those regions we just looked at, and the reason now that you see that we highlighted Corn Belt, Delta, Lake States, PAC Northwest, Pacific West, and Southeast, one, because that's where more land is available, two, because those are the better performing regions. Again, to look at this chart and start with, say, the 20-year total long-term performance. A farmer will tend to hold land for longer than 20 years. An institutional investor might hold land for less than 20 years. Although in the Nate Creek experience, we do have uh, cases where institutional investors have held land for 30 years as well. But what's really fascinating on the 20-year total return, this is not just cropland price, this is uh, returns to the operations, plus appreciation, less property taxes. Uh, the Pacific Northwest has actually been uh, the best performing by a couple points. Uh, Pacific West, despite the, the shorter periods that I showed and going all the way back, the longer periods where there's some more variability into a uh, Pacific West in uh, invested space has actually turned out really, really well too, again, on a NACRE basis. Uh, the Southeast, a little lower, Lake States, a little lower, Delta and Corn Belt, likewise, very, very attractive. And one of the things to look at is as you go from either right to left or left to right is how consistent that set of returns is. Now, the one-year return, we did talk about quite a bit why that's so high in the middle of the country. Uh, the five-year return, I think, is a long enough period of time to start to become representative. And if you kind of look at the five, 10, and 15-year return across all of these, you'll notice they're remarkably consistent. We didn't put it in this presentation, but another thing that really matters to investors, of course, is the maximum drawdown or the variability in returns. And the total, the number of times you hit a negative in these investment classes is almost zero. Hardly ever actually lose money on a total return basis. That's not the case with stocks or uh, other exposure to REITs and other forms of real estate investment. But again, I think this is just a good way to now that we've kind of looked around the country, start to uh, you know start the conversation about why we've talked a lot about the Corn Belt being uh, you know somewhat dependent on the strong balance sheets from government payments and other reasons that uh, commodity receipts are very high. Uh, Lake states are kind of like a, a you know younger brother to that same region. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, the incredible flexibility and the return of some other crops and to the fact that you can grow 300 different crops, literally 300 different crops, it's outlined a little bit more in the book, uh, makes that region have tremendous optionality. If, if onions don't work, maybe you can grow alfalfa. And if alfalfa doesn't work, back to soybeans. And if soybeans don't work, back to potatoes and potatoes to some other row crop or some other vegetable crop or hay. So it's just a remarkable region in terms of what can be done. Dave, what are you seeing in either the patterns or in, you know, you've got some big operations to manage around the country. What are you seeing? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? From an asset management standpoint, uh, certainly boots on the ground. And what we feel as well as a lot of the data that we've looked at as we've sort of worked through the different regions, there's two things that pop out at me very quickly here. And we go to the 20 year, the really long term, the Northern Plains and the Pacific Northwest, right? So the Northern Plains, what gets really interesting on a 20 year basis with a really high total return, we think about the technology expanding the Corn Belt, right? So uh, as uh, corn technology in terms of the, the, the traits in the hybrids, and the germplasm, along with chemistries and management practices, functionally expanding the corn belt. Now we're into corn growing in places where maybe it couldn't, and we're adding value to the land. And then in the Pacific Northwest, what gets really interesting, we've seen this and we feel it, and we're kind of experiencing it within the context of assets that we've got uh, under management, we're seeing that water the stable water in the Pacific Northwest, particularly uh, uh, the Columbia River water, is, is largely undervalued, right? The flexibility, the adaptability of climate plus consistent water, uh, we think that's another region where we've got a lot of opportunities. So we've had an overview from a national perspective and then taken a closer look at each of these regions. Now let's talk about Let's take a look into the crystal ball and see what these experts are thinking in terms of where, how much, 
parcel size, a lot of the actual deal mechanics. Dave Melnicki, smaller parcels or, or aggregate, larger aggregations, uh, what is the market rewarding with higher values right now? We have evidence of uh, <clears throat> transactions that kind of, it kind of varies across the board. Uh, when you get into larger holdings, uh, larger assets, multiple thousand acres, it can be very advantageous if those acres are all in a similar submarket and are producing a similar type of crop where you can reduce risk and you have known production history. There's at times a premium paid for that asset. Now we have the we have the luxury of working with family offices and institutional users who might have an asset of that sort. Uh, in other instances, larger parcels might mean several thousand acres spread across the country that are in different submarkets. And at that point, that can increase risk because you're dealing with different commodities and the fluctuation of, of commodity prices with, with multiple fruits, vegetables, and products, right? Uh, so there's there's anecdotal evidence and, and transactional evidence in both instances uh, where you could have a premium for a, a larger parcel. Uh, smaller parcels, there still is demand from the farmer next door. Uh, typically what we're seeing is those smaller parcels are more turnkey. Uh, there's lower due diligence because there's there's known production history. Um, you know, that's that differs from smaller parcels that might need CapEx. They might need uh, irrigation installation. They might need drainage installation. Uh, those types of parcels right now, given the, the higher cost and the, the time that it takes to get those into production and to get them into more stabilized production, we're typically seeing less of that at the moment. Are you seeing a, a similar dichotomy when it comes to farmland quality? Are, are buyers willing to pay a higher premium for the highest quality farmland? Um, is low quality dirt becoming more popular given these rising values? Yeah, I would I would say that high quality farmland is is typically the go to. Uh, you know, from a from an appraisal standpoint, we're always looking at risk and and what the market is doing and and where are the risks. So when you have a when you have a lower quality farm, uh, it's harder to maintain the revenue that's produced from that farm. Uh, expenses are are pretty uh, direct to most users right now, so it's, it's hard to avoid the expenses. Uh, but if you can if you can enhance your revenue uh, by having high quality cropland, uh, then that's certainly a, a lower risk. Uh, scenario for, for an owner or an, or an investor. Bruce, you mentioned earlier, Steve, you mentioned earlier, why does farmland, why does the farmland chart mirror inflation so perfectly while equities trend tend to trend in the opposite direction? And so the definition of inflation is the nominal change in the price of a widely consumed commodity or good. So literally, what do we spend and how much more do we have to spend if we bought exactly the same thing? Well, farmland produces broadly consumed commodities. So by definition, has an element that is as close to the center of inflation as you can in fact get. Uh, the other issue is that farmland is not depreciable. So you don't have to replace it. And if you have inflation and you have to replace, say, an apartment building, the nominal cost of doing so through economic depreciation is something you have to directly deduct out of that return series. And you literally don't do that with farmland. The final factor, and again, this is a bit overly academic perhaps, but I think about two, about 200 years ago, uh, Adam Smith kind of in the Wealth of Nations, um, and then later Ricardo and Ricardian Rent, the idea that the most fixed factor of production is the element in the production system that captures the real rent. As real rent goes up, that would be the expected, the, the fixed asset is farmland. So farmland captures that increasing rent through time. Uh, the, you know, it's not a perfect correlation because there's still you know, blips and bleeps and jumps and fits and starts and so on. But farmland also, if you were to simply perform the thought experiment that if you had permanent income 
and only discounted it by the current, say, 10-year rate or some other measure of the cost of capital on farmland. You would notice that farmland income expectations are far smoother than changes in interest rates. So <clears throat> if you, when the interest rates were held artificially low by the Fed to try to encourage additional production, farmland markets actually didn't skyrocket. They're much smoother than that. And when interest rates fell back to, a, you know, moved up to a more normal level, farmland values didn't somehow drop precipitously. In, in a sense, farmland markets are the better predictor of the long-term cap rate. I don't know if that helps or not, but um, it's, it's, um, it's also simply an empirical issue. If one was to say, what are the assets that um, uh, become a numeraire, if you will? So the thought experiment kind of goes the same way that the McDonald's thought experiment works for comparing currencies. How much does it cost to buy a McDonald's Big Mac in the U.S.? How much does it cost to buy a McDonald's Big Mac in euros? And that ratio should essentially tell you the relative value of one currency to another. Well, farmland to some degree is that analog. It's something we can use as the numerator. How many bushels of corn can each acre produce? And that bushel of corn is something like a dollar, right? So if we were to continue that thought experiment across all assets at the same time, Farmland is at least closer to the things that would be modified by nominal price changes than any other asset. So, Bruce, when you uh, you had the chart earlier that showed the uh, farmland correlation with inflation, and what is that? What is that spread? You showed the chart, but what's what's an average over time? Well, it, that's a great question, and I would say it depends a little on the history, but I'll I'll throw one out there that's a little bit wrong, but it's at least instructive. Uh, we sort of have a long-term number of about four to five in mind. Now, back when interest rates and inflation rates were really high in the 70s, that felt like a really giant number. And when we get clear to the front end and we had a relatively stable period of time after the housing crisis, then again, until the pandemic began, I would say it's, it's pulled in a little bit, but that's kind of reflecting the lower total level all rates were at for that decade. So I've I, I've struggled, you know. A lot of folks want to look back to the the seventies and the eighties and find the corollary to today. And of course, the the seventies is when farmland values really, you know, jumped up to those nineteen eighty peaks. And then you had high inflation and high interest rates. And I was looking back at some Iowa averages today. And nineteen nineteen seventy three, the average price of an acre of farmland in Iowa was six hundred and thirty five bucks an acre. And coming out of 1972, inflation was at 3.3%, and then it jumped up to 6.2% um, in 1973, and then uh, by 1974, 11%. And as I sit here today, um, you know, cap rates on farmland are in that two and a half to three percent range, and you're paying six to seven percent for your capital if you're borrowing money. And I've struggled to get my my brain wrapped around how can farmland values go up when the cost of capital is going up, but you look back to the seventies and that's exactly what it did. And, and so by 1981, your average acre of farmland in Iowa went from that uh, 635 bucks in 1973, it went all the way up to 2147 an acre. And yet inflation was at 10% and interest rates were at 16%. And and that's a hard concept to get your get your brain around, but that's what you're you're describing now. But but then um, by 1987, that average acre of farmland dropped 875 bucks an acre as Paul Volcker raised interest rates. So as you as you think about the 70s and the 80s and the corollary to today, um, wh where are we at? Are we closer to 73? Are we closer to 81? Can you even relate back to that period, or is this different this time? Oh, that's a great question. And that's a that's a really fun question. And I'll unfortunately give you a little bit too academic of a response, perhaps. I think you laid that out incredibly clearly. I think the 80s provide almost no guidance. I'll give you a couple of reasons why. In the 80s, the decline in farmland values was really a farm sector event. We had a, a grain embargo. We had a oil crisis. We had national events. We were changing what we exported. We had nominal interest rates on farm loans that were 18%. We were making 80% loan to value ratio loans and we were having 40 year amortizations. We have none of those conditions now. And we also have crop insurance now. 
And now we export differently and we use a much broader collection of demands to use up the corn market and the soybean market in particular. So I think it's, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. But in the 80s, we also had kind of a lender participation in the run-up and a lender participation in the collapse of farmland values. Now farmland is really much more of an integrated asset class in the national markets. The other, the other way to understand, and again, I apologize in advance, this will sound a little academic. The other way to get your mind around why can farmland values go up when inflation rates are high and the cost of capital is high, we've often shown, although we didn't put it in this presentation, the idea that you buy income in the future with a cap rate. But that cap rate, that denominator, if you will, is the total rate of return you have to earn minus the growth rate in that income stream. So it's like an R minus G uh, kind of idea. We do this in, in equities as well. So if you have to earn 6% and your asset is appreciating at 4%, then you'll pay 50 times earning because six minus 4% is two. And you'd pay $50 for every dollar. What I think is happening here is actually that the markets are right. I, I'm uh, when we, if we get to a conversation about you know predicting and crystal balling, I think markets are about right. And what's happened is our return requirements have gone up with the cost of capital and inflation. Nominal rates have gone up. Our expectations for returns. And suppose now we need ten percent to make an investment in farmland total return. And again, your cap rates are still two or three or something. But what we're looking at is ten minus two plus your appreciation rate. So. Again, if, if now we need 10 and we used to need six, but we're going to get a total inflation effect that really makes that you know 10 minus eight is still two, we had 8% inflation. So I think you get a scaling up at the same time and it makes sense to pay more under the you know, assumption that inflation were permanent, then it's really easy math. When you don't know how long inflation is going to last, you have to make some adjustments. But it's that general idea that the cap rate in includes more than just a risk-free denominator. Given that farmland returns traditionally come in at around 3%, and what we've seen as far as the Fed lifting interest rates from zero to nearly 4% this year, why would an investor choose farmland over a sure bet at the bank? Well, you know, the, you know, I'll I'll take it, and I'd love to to give everybody else's opinion. But you know, in my twenty year career of of peddling farmland, you know, what, what's fascinating is that never once have uh, farmland investors had a great alternative. Right? Um, you know, for years I've heard, well, I can't get a return on my money at the bank, and CDs aren't worth anything, and my money market accounts aren't worth anything. And so I'll accept a two, 3% return on farmland because it's better than what I can get elsewhere. And I just got an email today, you know, uh, from a local bank uh, that is offering a four and a quarter uh, CD rate. And so all of a sudden you've got an alternative to farmland where farmland has been returning that two and a half, three percent 3% return. And now you can just go put it in the, the bank and get a 4% return. But of course, when inflation is running at seven seven or eight three, um, you're you're actually going backwards, right? And so the 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 smart money in the world is saying, hey, look, I'm going to come into farmland. My my cash yield's low, but my overall yield, as commodity prices inflate, um, I'll get that inflation protection in farmland. And so they're banking on appreciation. And you know, as we were walking through earlier, that historical twenty year appreciation rate's been five. And as you're sitting here today with cap rates in that two and a half to three and CPI, let's call eight for this example, then you really need to be picking up, um, you know, 8% on the appreciation here uh, to, to hold it together. And that's what that's what folks are betting on when they come into farmland right now. They don't want just a cash yield at 4% when inflation's at eight because they're going backwards 4%. Uh, so if, if they can get into farmland and get some cash yield with some opportunity for some appreciation, that's where they want to be right now. And time will tell if that's if that's a good bet or not. But that's what we're seeing a lot of, of outside capital do. And I'd make another note, um, you know, historically, when you look at our 
transactions in the Midwest, about 70% of everything we've always sold has sold to farmers. And we're seeing a big pivot right now. We're seeing a lot of outside capital come in. And I would say it's closer to 50 to 60% of our, our transactions are selling to farmers. And you're starting to see a lot of that outside capital come to the marketplace and want to buy farmland as an investment, as an inflation hedge. Yeah. And Steve, you know, pivoting on that same theme of outside capital that's coming in, there's another thought process uh, behind where a lot of that capital is coming from, right? So you've got, we, we have these conversations quite a lot where folks may be in a different asset class, highly appreciated real estate, and they're stepping back and they're saying, oh my gosh, I've, I've captured a ton of value relative to an inflationary market. I've got challenges of where I need to put it because everything on a relative basis is expensive. Certainly stacking debt behind it is expensive. And folks are coming back and saying, hey, of all of my options that have uncertainty and potential downside, farmland looks pretty darn good, right? Because those baseline fundamental characteristics uh, are leading it in the right direction. And th those conversations are happening quite a lot with folks that haven't necessarily played in the farmland asset class a lot. And they're looking at real value capture and the potential to transition into an asset class that has those inflation hedge characteristics. Given all those factors, current farmland values, rising inflation, the upward creep of interest rates, where would each of you invest half a million dollars in today's market? Let's go around the table and start with you, Dave Melnicki. Yeah, as an appraiser, uh, we look at risk and we're somewhat risk averse. Uh, my place would be the Corn Belt. Uh, the reason being is that you want to stick with something that is known, it has a great track record. Uh, corn and soy commodity prices are strong, yes. Uh, I do believe that they're going to stay elevated based on geopolitical the geopolitical environment uh, across the globe, and that right that right there is really the the main reason to to be in the corn belt. Okay, we've got a one for the corn belt, Dave Muth. Yeah, I think I think Dave's uh, comments are correct. Right, um, you do have the challenge of. Uh, really inflated values in the Corn Belt, right? In the context of, okay, uh, and it goes back to this conversation around where are we at, 1973, 1980, 82, et cetera. So you're, you're trying to place that half million dollars in the Corn Belt at a highly inflated market. I think that you're still stable. I think that you're still predictable in the Corn Belt. Uh, there's a couple other thought processes behind it, right? So if we think about where we're going in terms of uh, biofuel production, in terms of some of the other externalities that are really driving things, the, the Delta is pretty interesting. The Delta is also a little bit challenging to get into asset sizes bigger. So if we're at that half million basis, uh, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky to get into, but those crops have a strong future from a number of uh, different perspectives. Now, we're really interested in the Pacific Northwest, right? And so uh, we, we think that, that the stability and the availability of water is undervalued. And so if you pin me down and said, I had to put a, a half million dollars anywhere, I would go in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, Bruce, you've got a half a million dollar checkbook. Where are you going to where are you going to invest in farmland nationwide? So I uh, would have to piggyback a bit of what Dave said. I think that the uh, opportunity to be uh, careful and get something that has a lot of optionality in the Pacific Northwest right now is really really high. The water resources, what I see changing going forward, favors that optionality to some degree, and it just hasn't kind of run up quite the same pace that the middle of the country has. Splitting between the Corn Belt and uh, the Pacific Northwest, Steve, you could have the deciding vote. You know, this is this is a, a fun exercise, and I think um, you know I'm a Midwest guy, and I, uh, my family farms here uh, in Iowa, and and so you, you know your you, corn and soybean country is the 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 workhorse and farmland returns, and that's that's where you want to be historically, but. 
you know, as I've watched the run up and, and farmland values, and this goes back to what Dave was talking about earlier, um, you know, Iowa, Illinois, a lot of these Corn Belt states were the big benefactors of a lot of that CFAP, MFP money. And the farmland market, frankly, in the Midwest has heated up uh, much higher and much faster than it has in other parts of the country. And so uh, we get an opportunity to look at a lot of transactions. The Mississippi Delta values are higher there, but they're not higher to the degree that they are in the Midwest. Uh, you know, Dave and Bruce both talked about the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, you've got so much crop optionality in Washington state, they grow over 100 different crops. And so, you, you know, it, you're not tied to corn and soybean prices. Uh, so again, you got a market that's not as hot as the Midwest, and you've got more optionality there long term. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but just to be a contrarian, I'm going to talk about California for a minute uh, with, with what's happening in California around water. Um, with the the Sigma um, uh, Groundwater Act, so in California, there's about 28 million um, acres of of land, and and when you look at what's going to be required uh, to to meet the Sigma um, uh, water issues, uh, we think anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of that that land is going to get fallowed over the next 50 years. And so land that's got good water in California, they can do things in California you just can't do elsewhere with that Mediterranean climate. You can grow almonds and pistachios and you, you can't do that in the Midwest. You can't do that in the Pacific Northwest. You can't do that in the Mississippi Delta. And so when I look at California, I think, you know, you've got you've got some political headwinds, obviously, but you've got land that you just can't. Uh, do what you can do in California and other parts of the country. And and I think, you know, water is king. And and so I think um, that market's got some real upside. Uh, if you've got good, good, good water, uh, I think that's where you want to be. But um, but to, to, to bring it back, Pacific Northwest, we spent a lot of time in that market. And, and uh, if I was going to pick, if I'm going to be the tiebreaker here between uh, Midwest and Pacific Northwest, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Pacific Northwest. Excellent. Great insight. Now, let me get you to back that up and follow up with your best estimate, Steve, on farmland values in the coming year. Rising, falling, or holding steady? You know, I'm going to go I'm going to go higher in 2023. And, and I say that uh, we just had the November uh, crop insurance prices set and corn was about a buck higher than the spring crop insurance price. And it's likely that those commodity prices are going to carry into the February crop insurance price um, period where you're going to lock in your uh, insurable revenue pricing in February. And it looks like uh, farmers are set up to have another good year in 2023 and, and make good money. And, and so you've got, uh, again, this, this investor appetite for farmland that wants the inflation hedge. You're going to have strong farmer profitability, uh, lack of alternative investments and while farmland's really expensive uh, i think it could go a little bit higher yet in 2023 um, but i i think if you ask me over a 10-year period i think farmland uh, will be worth more 10 years from now than it is today i think next year it might be worth a little bit more than it is today but i think somewhere between next year and year 10 there will be a dip and i just don't know when uh, i'm really concerned about uh, these interest rates, and if there's enough cash buyers out there to continue to prop the market up. Dave Melnicki, where do you see farmland values going in 2023? Yeah, so these these larger macro trends that we've discussed typically take time to work through the market. We've seen cash rents increase dramatically. Uh, the, the potential for cash rents to increase for next season and beyond is definitely there. Uh, I feel that some buyers potentially who are going to make a move might be a little bit more skittish based on the current uh, price of capital. Uh, so I, I feel that we're going to kind of come down from 35,000 feet to about 30,000 feet and wane just a little bit, uh, certainly not across the country, maybe in certain markets. Still very solid uh, investment vehicle, still very solid values. But I think it's just going to cool just a touch, if not remain stable. 
stable to slightly cooler. Uh, Dave Muth? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, right? So, so the timing question is, is certainly a revel, uh, relevant one that Steve brought up. You know, when we're out in the field, uh, we, we think about farmer owner operators as a uh, significant portion of the buyer pool, right? And there's certainly a lot of them that, that went through some of those 80s dynamics that we're talking about. And I, I feel a little bit of a tension out there in the marketplace in the context of uh, folks are, are, are pretty optimistic about their personal budgets, right? When they look at operating their land and what they can do from a net income and a working capital standpoint. Uh, but they're also a little bit concerned, right? This has been really dynamic over a couple of years. And so if we step back and we think about an increasing cost of capital, we think about outside capital playing a major role going forward, which, which I think we're all pretty convinced it will uh, from, from all of these different factors that we've talked through. Uh, they're going to put a floor on where farmland can move from a downward standpoint. Okay. And, and we put this all together and we uh, sort of aggregate this tension and these dynamics I could see a, a little bit of a stagnation relative to this dynamic environment that we've been through, and perhaps just a little bit of settling in some markets uh, over the course of the next year. I do agree with Steve, right? Uh, the long-term dynamics are very clear, right? We're, we're on the, the same sort of patterns that Bruce has outlined really, really clearly uh, from a long-term standpoint. Um, I, I think that we could see some of that stagnation and perhaps a little bit of settling in some markets over the course of next year. Bruce, I'll let you round it out. Where do you where do you see farmland values headed for 2023, sir? It's echoing everything that's just been said. It's a more complicated question right now than it was a year ago. I think it's um, you know it was actually a pretty easy call a year ago. Frankly, we we look pretty smart um, if you look back and then. Uh, consider what we were kind of predicting. I think it's a lot harder to call this time, but what I do see is some of the things that have been described. In addition, um, we have things like payments. Um, that was sort of something that was taboo for a while because we had crop insurance and the idea was if you had crop insurance, you didn't have to make localized ad hoc payments. 2012, the biggest drought in history, we didn't have ad hoc payments. We've had all kinds of other forms of government support, but mostly I think we're seeing a uh, pivot toward the things we're willing to pay for with farmland as the underlying asset, uh, energy and carbon and other things. And it, it may not materialize for a long time. Uh, cash prices in the out years are still pretty high. Um, if you don't get a, you know, a major shock to production, um, it's hard to see that they'll go too much higher. But I think all of those forces line up as we've been saying. I, I personally think it's going to be stable to up. I won't be surprised if, if it's down a little bit, though. It's just we're kind of at that harder to predict uh, point. But I do think in the long run, markets are right. And uh, in the long run, prices will be higher. I think it's not a tough prediction, though. Uh, just as price levels will continue to go up in the economy everywhere, I think that's going to carry the farmland along with it. But again, in the next year, that time period is a tough interval of time to fully predict. You know, I'll, I'll jump in with a with another thought. We're we're in auction season here in the Midwest, where we're selling uh, a couple farms a day at, at farm auction, and we're getting just phenomenal results at these auctions. But you know, what you do notice is that while you're you're having a phenomenal result. It's pretty thin. Um, there's there's a couple people in the room that that want to pay some of these big prices, but it's not real deep. And you know, years ago, I um, during a, a farmland correction coming out of 2013, I I wrote an article that you know we're we're one flat tire away from having a poor auction result. The wrong guy uh, gets a flat tire on the way of the auction. Maybe the outcome's different. And and so you know the the fact that interest rates have moved up so hard and so fast, and you've really eliminated the ability for leveraged buyers to participate in the market. You're really completely reliant upon um, cash buyers, so that outside capital or farmers that um, are in a great financial position that they can they can pay cash. But at what point does that? cash dry up or are there other investment alternatives that look more attractive 
Um, and, and does that dynamic change? And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic the market's going to keep performing pretty well, but I'm also pretty anxious about it, just kind of living in the, the real world of transactions on a daily basis. Thank you, gentlemen. What a great series of insights and observations from Dr. Bruce Sherrick, the director of the TIA Center for Farmland Research at the University of Illinois. Dave Muth, the managing director of People's Company Capital Markets. Dave Milnicki, director of appraisal at People's Company and People's Company president, Steve Brewer. Before we conclude, Steve, Give us an idea who we have on tap for the 2023 Land Investment Expo coming up on January 10th. Yeah, Eric, we've got a we've got a great program. Really excited about it this year. Uh, uh, Jimmy John, founder of Jimmy John's, is going to be one of our keynote speakers. Uh, he's a big farmland owner in Illinois and and uh, passionate about uh, recreation and conservation. And so we're excited to have Jimmy on the program. Uh, Frank Luntz, uh, uh, researcher, political pollster, uh, nationally known, uh, also on the program. Of course, with the political environment we're in, his insights will be uh, to, great to garner as we head into the next presidential election. Uh, Peter Zeehan, we've had Peter on the program a couple times now. Uh, Peter's a geopolitical strategist and uh, been a fan favorite through the years. Uh, so anxious to have him back. And then we've got uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, Vivek is uh, um, the CEO and founder of Strive Capital, uh, real outspoken um, on, on ESG right now and a uh, frequent uh, contributor on CNBC and other media outlets. And so I think uh, um, you folks will enjoy hearing uh, from Vivek. And then Jeremy Siegel. Uh, Jeremy's with the Wharton School of Business. Uh, he's been real critical of the Federal Reserve and and uh, how aggressive they've been in uh, uh, raising interest rates and whatnot. So we've got just a, a well-rounded program. Uh, really excited about it. It's January 10th here in Iowa. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, it's landinvestmentexpo.com. But uh, a lot of the things we talked about here today uh, will be breakout sessions at the Land Expo and, of course, uh, keynote presentations and I uh, will go much deeper than we were able to do on this call today. Definitely. It's really increasing in popularity and attendance on an annual basis. I can't wait to see how 2023 shapes up at the Iowa Event Center in downtown Des Moines. Thanks all of you for participating in the 2022 National Land Values Seminar. For the listeners, we will make every effort to answer all of your questions. And be sure to go to peoplescompany.com to download the National Land Values Report and access a recording of this webinar. Thank you again for joining us for the Land Report. I'm Eric O'Keefe.